Yes, it's okay. Oh, live. Okay, you, I think you guys can see the live on the top. Okay, anyway, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, we're going to start, yeah? Uh, okay, thank you for joining us today for Bamboo Broadcast Studios, learning from ecology, art, and food. Um, so Bamboo Broadcast Studio is a post-museum project presented under Alternative Ecology, which is an art and ecology event curated by Wang Roping and project managed by Susanna Tan. Um, so this session today, we will have four artists, uh, art groups, uh, sharing about their very interesting projects where they worked with people who grow food and they will share with us what they've learned and um, their experiences. Um, so we are all in different parts of the world um, and sometimes the internet is not very stable, so please bear with us. Um, uh, the format today will be two sharings followed by a short break, then another sh two sharings and then Q&A. Um, so I'm Jennifer Teo from Post Museum. Thank you again for coming. Uh, so we will start with our friends in Mexico because it's midnight at the moment over there. Uh, so let's welcome Colectivo Amasijo. Um, yeah, take it away, girls. Um, hello. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, who is watching it. And thank you, Jennifer, for inviting us. And we are going to share a presentation to help us uh, to explain what we do uh, with images. <laughs> OK, uh, so sharing screen. Okay. OK. OK. Uh, can you see it now? Uh, you know. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay, here. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't move. Yes, there you go. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Oh, sorry. Let me try to use layout. No, why is it still me? Maybe you can speak common. Hey, see, oh, I can. Okay. So, this is, well, we are Colectivo Masijo. We are a uh, a female-run collective uh, based in Mexico City, uh, but the women of our collective come from different parts of Mexico, and uh, we work with collective cooking and we, uh, as a methodology of listening to the narrative of women close to the land in order to understand the the, uh, like to see the real cost of the degradation of the land uh, through narrative that has an affection, a, a real affection and a connection with it. Also, we work, uh, these narratives help us to see the path of regeneration. And um, see, so, and also we work uh, with women because we want to talk about the fact that more than 50% of the food that we eat is actually grown by women, but women owns less than 2% of the land. So, so they really depend on communal land, on forests, on jungles, on rivers that has no ownership. So their life is completely interwined with the, with the, with the territory. So they they become the defenders of the of the life and the defenders of the territory in the front line. Uh, this is a little bit about how we work and our methodology. So how we please uh, listen to the see to the narrative, and how after listening to all this narrative, we have like an archive of of them, and uh, we take like. Uh, patrons and and then we share we share this narrative with uh, in different ways like in exhibitions in films uh, by cooking share, share and, narrative. Yeah. And, the, and all this way of sharing has to be completely uh, close to the community and have to give something back to the community and when we talk of giving something back is talking about the regeneration of the land uh, of the relations of the bodies of and we see it through the sowing of biodiversity. Uh, so for today, we are going to, no, I don't know, see. So you know, that one of the things that I will also want to share before that is like, when we arrive to a territory, it's always by invitation. So it's like 
by different motives, we are, were invited to different places. And we work like this methodology in the places we've, we've been. And it's a way of, yes, of being invited and they start listening through cooking, no? And, and, and one of the places and territories that we're gonna share today of our relationship with, with people that are close to the land and who grew food is Milpalta, which is here in Mexico City. See, so today we are going to talk about where we live, that actually the name Mexico City is not a very good one because more than half percent of Mexico City is, actual, is actually rural. And uh, especially the south, uh, that this region is called Milpalta, and in Nahuatl is Momoshko, uh, Mamalacatepec Mama Momoshko, that means altars in the mountains. Uh, this in this place they uh, so they they sow steel food the way they used to sow it uh, more than 700 years ago and the it's the milpa system the milpa system is when you combine uh, corn uh, beans and and a squash and you make through this three combination an ecosystem so when the herbs start to rise with all this food, you don't call them bad herbs, you call them quelites and it's food. When uh, bugs start to arrive or worms or, or rabbits, you don't call them plagues, but it's also part of the system and it's also food. So it's, and in this part of, of Mexico is the mountains. So they saw the, the milpa system through terraces. So because it's on a slope, you have, they have to do terraces to contain the, the earth so they can sow. And this was a, 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 a technology that was created more than 700 years ago. So after going for one year, we decided to do a, a, a market in a contemporary museum in Mexico City. And it was to uh, bring in one space uh, the rural and the urban community to start to make a uh, like to build bridge between those two that has been completely separated no we have been fragmented we have been been told that there is a different that pr the producers and the consumers are completely different and well this is a uh, completely see so people doesn't know where the, their food is coming. So in this market, we invited uh, women producers to bring all the uh, biodiversity that they recollect from the uh, forest, like the medicinal herbs, the mushrooms, and also what they saw in their backyards and in the, in the milpas, then the family milpas. And it was very interesting because during this market, which, which was like in the sowing season, they, they came also a lot of academics that also like they, they are farmers and academics and they're explaining like the situation of Milpalta. One of the most interesting things of Milpalta is like a place where there is a common land. So all the all the the people are born with land. They don't it's like you are like owning it like in a community. And then you pass it to 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 your 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 kids or your lineage, and then you are always taking care of the land because somebody will will inherit this land. So this is like the a place that has been uh, conserved as a conservation land. And one of the struggles of this land is like the they want to change the the ownership of the land to make it uh, rural, so they can start like constructing things because it's like the only part of Mexico City that still have like a very big forest and a very big system of uh, agriculture, you know? So this was like the, 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 the academics talking about the situation and the, and the, how important it was for the, for the people in the center of the city to acknowledge this territory and really start like protecting in, in, in a joint way because most of the water that comes to, to the city is like arrives into this forest and is drained through the mountains to the city, you know? So it was like like call to all of us to, to start like talking about Milpalta and not thinking that it's like a 
territory and mountains. So this was like the, the market in the other museum. And something that was very interesting is was to bring life to a place that is dead, no? Like museum are places where you don't see life. And when this, all these fruits start to arrive, all these herbs start to arrive, life was starting to emerge in these in this spaces, no? So it was also very funny how to uh, see how to work with this, no? When some suddenly there was like flies, uh, flies and worms and all these kind of of thing that was bringing also to the the food, no? And also, well, one of the the things we did was uh, to uh, explain all the how the knowledge is also. So all this knowledge that we are not seeing, that we are not recognizing, how to put it in on writing, how to create a visual aids to 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 see it, no? And so it was this like uh, medicinal herbs. I sorry. And something that was also very important in this project that the community of Milpalta told us it was that it it was the first time they were invited to a contemporary museum. So th they were seeing as a problem uh, as a contemporary problematic and as a contemporary issue uh, that is the def is the um, defense of the territory and not as a how can you say see it was not like they told us like they always invite us to like uh, ethno ethnological museums or or culture museums but not in, not in a contemporary way no so it's like the old the past, like like the folklore, but this was this was like the first time they were invited to to really talk about the problematic they were living in a contemporary se scenario, no? And it was like a change of, of of perception also into the the people that went to the museum. And one of the things like they told us also, it was like, okay, you let's let's come, let's let's create this market together. But you cannot go, you know. This if you start like, like working with us, it's like you have to to keep on the the relationship, you no. Know? And and in this, through this uh, petition, we understood like like something that Martina said very good, you no. Know? This way of caring, like caring is not one one only one day, you no. Know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was to understand that so if talking about working with farmers. One of the most important thing is that it is a relationship that you have to keep on going. You no, know? it's not something that you you can just work one time and then leave. You no, know? it's it's like growing food. It's a caring system that you have to work every day. So after this market, uh, we decide to do um, to open a, a space, a, a public kitchen, where all the food of this producer was brought here and with a woman of the collective of the center of the collective we will start cooking it uh, giving workshops um like offering in, we had a, a table for 10 and we were offered this food we also make like more big events that help us to sustain the collective and we we pro we like change and produce food from from the from the things they grow in their in their patios or milpas and, and the collective land, no? Uh, so sorry, so can I interrupt uh, for a bit? Uh, your slides are not moving. Do you want to play them? No, why is not moving? Yeah. Oh, we're talking all about... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> why are not, they are not moving? <gasps> because... Yeah. No, this well. This is Mexico City. This is Milpalta, the uh, territory that we're uh, talking about. Oh my God! This is the market. This is the market that we did in this contemporary museum. This is well, see, <laughs> more of the market, the conference of the com uh, of the community of Milpalta, talking about uh, the struggle of the defend of the land, and more talks. And this is the life entering through the museum in unexpected ways. This is the knowledge transmitted through the medicinal herbs. And this is the place that we were talking about now, Carmen and I, that is this communal kitchen or this public kitchen 
in the center of the city where uh, food of meal palta arrives. We cook it uh, there and we share it with other people. We do projects. So it's a way of keeping the relationship going, no? that the, the, the farmers is a, it's a way of living. It's a way of, of that you are producing every single day and every single day is, is taking care of your harvest, your animals. So this is the place where the food that they are producing comes. We transform it and we do like different ways of, of also giving back this this learning. No, so it's a way of how can we bring the the rural way of, of understanding the 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 life through the to the city. Um, so we play with fire. We play with the with the way we eat. We do <coughs> seminars inside the kitchen, etc. And now, uh, well, we are <laughs> running out of time, but the new project of this iteration with Milpalta is will become the La Milpalta Escuela, that means the Milpalta School. Um, so this is a project that we are like now doing with with a, a, also a collective that that is in Milpalta, which is Calpulete Calco. No, so now this is like these two like. Uh, the two, two projects coming together in a very specific uh, in a very specific way of, of of working together and it's it's it has the form of, of the school and it's inviting different people from from their own community but also people from the art community you know that they will join and and work for the for the students that arrive to the school so this school will uh, the length of this school is also is the same length as the cycle of of the harvest so this is like the the como se llama? the ciclo agricola. the agricultural cycle. cycle and all the works that you have to do depending on the cycle so it's also understanding that you can measure start measuring time not through the way that we are measuring in the city, but the, through the way that is measured in the rural. Uh, I don't know if it happens also in Singapore, but in Mexico, in the, in our school, we are taught uh, the different seasons of the global north, no? like winter, summer, uh, autumn. But actually in Mexico, this season doesn't even exist. We only have two seasons, that is rains and dries. And we are not even taught that in our school, no? So, uh, and in this uh, school is going one, uh, like, and it's also very important to talk about, this is a way of, of giving back in an economic way, also all the knowledge that is growing uh, food, no? Because we are, we are, uh, we are, we think that the way we are giving back all is to pay for the food that they are producing. But that is nothing compared to all the knowledge that is put in the land to get the food. So it's a way to understanding all the complexity that the, see that exists when you are producing food. That is more, more important than just uh, the food itself. So we are going to do weekends in these communities uh, and we want to explain, uh, see, one one weekend in, in Milpalta, just to show the how structure of, 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 the, of the curricula, no? So we will have five, uh, five weekends in, in Milpalta and five sessions of online sessions with different uh, artists and collectives that work also in, with, in agriculture and, and art. And, uh, well, this is like the... See the structure of of of, uh, of of one of the of this weekend, no? So the name is La Milpa, the uh, the teacher, talking about how the Milpa, the 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 see the, the sewing system can be the teacher, and the people who are taking care of the Milpa are the translation translators of this knowledge. So we are going just to talk very quick, very briefly about the structure. So it's arriving on the Friday to um uh, to a house of the community and talk about the agroecological system uh, that uh, needs to be 
see the agroecological system of the world that we are going to do for that uh, moment of time. So the first one will be to understand the conservation of the terraces. On Saturday is working in the morning. In the milpa. In the milpa. And perhaps I think I'm going to show more this, this structure, sorry. Mm -hmm. So see, so on Friday is the, present, the theoretical presentation of the agroecological system of the corresponding labor. On Saturday is actually going to the milpa to work the milpa. So it's also like through your body, understanding the work that is giving for the production of the food. Then in the after that it's a, a work it's a workshop of cooking with the with the agent of the milpa depending on the time. What is impressive of this way of, of sowing in Mexico is that the milpa gives you food since the moment that you sow it. So you don't have to wait until the, the corn is ready because it starts to produce food since the very beginning with the herbs that are growing, with the with everything. I'm going to show some photos. And then we are inviting artists to give to use their practice in a conversation with the land. So it's through dancing, through singing, through tell, telling histories. And then on Sunday is to do a, a walk around the different ecosystem of Milpalta, also to start recon, recognizing the contemporary problems that are, are hitting this, this part, these territories being the uh, gentrification, the growing of the of the urban of the urban uh, place, uh, the loss of biodiversity, etc. But it's through walking and through putting your body uh, in in that place. And at the end is to is learn how to build uh, technologies to support also the milpa. No. Uh, well, this is the first session that I'm not going to uh, I'm going to explain it, but photo. So the first work of the milpa is to open the the, land, the earth, so it can so the first uh, humidity can start to arrive and start to put water on the land. Okay, so this is the way they they will still use horses to make uh, to plant the the corn. Then the first uh, workshop it's. Uh, to cook, what, what is beautiful is, this is the moment of the most ripe moment of Mexico, but we can still find food that is that with the little of humidity. So this is the, all the, the food that we, are, we can find now in the, dry, in the dry season that we are going to cook with. Um, and for the uh, first workshop, we are going to invite uh, Fernando Palma, that is an artist, that work from the community and he works with the local knowledge and it's also he's going to do a workshop about the narrative and the mythical narrative that's in the in the see and the histories that surrounds in that territory he needs to understand how the land can give also the a way of of telling history no and even how the in our dreams the plants the birds talk to, to us when you have when you have a relationship with them and they can give you back histories in return no so it's to and how this this way of telling this histor histories is not about only the past but it can be also in the present and we can still do do uh, we can still create them and at the end we are going to walk in also what is beautiful about in milpalta is that they grow corn in what in places that was used to be a ceremonial uh, Hispanic sites, Hispanic sites, that thanks to this work they they can grow milpa because they they see they put the land in order to be sow it. This is also the territory of Milpalta. This is one of the most in the uh, important volcanoes of Mexico City. That is the Popocatépetl in the sea. Uh, La mujer dormida. And this is Isla Cihuatl. And by the end, we are going to learn how to do this. Uh, this, ¿cómo se llama? Uh, this, these terraces. Well, the terraces is there, and and these walls, these uh, stone walls that support the, the the land and the soil. No, so we will learn how to 
make it and how because this is the, the places that are fragmented right now because of the gentrification so we will talk about also this this kind of how to build them again no and protect them and well this is one a uh, photo of very ancient uh, terraces that has been damaged because of the growth of urbanization and basically well that, that's like an example of, of one of the session of one of the structure of this school and that uh, that will be like every we, uh, five weekends and we are in the process of inviting people to come to the to come to come to the school and we are like about to open it like in from the agricultural cycle start which is in march and I hope we didn't go too far. I'm sorry because of the not moving of the images. See, and this is a presentation just to see the system that one way of sewing can embrace, no? All the knowledge that one the one system can give, can give, no? And thank you very much for listening. <laughs> okay, thank you, Carmen and Martina. Uh, Okay, so I think uh, let's just move on to our friends from Australia, uh, from Sydney, and uh, Lucas and Kim, I'll get you on stage. You mom. Okay. And uh, Kim, okay, and unmute you, and then I'm going to leave, okay? You guys take over. Thanks, Jennifer, and um, thanks to Carmen and Martina. So interesting to hear about the context from your part of the world. Um, Kim and I actually live in a city called Wollongong, which is uh, about one hour south of Sydney. And this is uh, the Aboriginal country that we are living on is Wadi Wadi and Darawal land. And um, all the different places that our presenters are coming from today around the world uh, have First Nations um, people and in our part of the world, that's what they're called, the Darwal and the Wadi Wadi people. And um, the part of the world where we're going to talk about today is up in the state of Queensland and the, the, the land there is the land of the Yuiburra people. Kim? Thanks, Lucas. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Carmen and Martina, for your talk. It was fantastic. And I, I immediately thought there were many parallels, even though you're doing something completely different to what we've been doing. There are, there are many parallels in your approach and the way you talked about um, doing something by invitation, which is an approach that we have taken to in our, in our sort of uh, ecological projects. And while, um, while the focus of our our work on a project in Queensland called Sugar Versus the Reef. Um, it, it is about food, but in a different kind of way. So maybe we should um, start with some images, Lucas, or we're going to start with the video. Yes, I've got, um, I think I'm sharing my screen, but I'm not seeing it here yet. Perhaps our tech support people can tell me. Oh, there it comes. So um, there you can see our names, Lucas Eileen and Kim Williams, and there are some links there to the projects that we're going to talk about today. Uh, one of them is called Sugar Versus the Reef. And um, as it sounds, it's very much around the sugarcane industry in Queensland. And I'm, I actually have a T-shirt that Kim designed from our project, which I'm wearing today. And we'll talk about this, um, this project. And um, so we'll start with, um, yeah, Kim mentioned that um, this idea of working from invitation, um, which um, is also really um, important for us. And let me just see if I can advance my slides here. Oh, here we go. There you go. Yeah. So this is John Sweet, who uh, um, has died now. But when we started this project back in 2014, 2015, John invited us. He's a retired farmer who invited us to come and work. Artists can come and work with farmers on the problem of the environmental tensions between the sugarcane industry and the Great Barrier Reef, which is a world uh, environmental heritage place. 
And um, as you will see in this next slide, there's a very close connection between the Great Barrier Reef and the sugarcane farmland in Queensland. So here Which is, here. Um, and, and, you know, just so that you, to put it in context, the sugarcane industry in Australia, at least, is very much a monocultural cropping industry. So people just grow miles and miles and miles of sugarcane, and that's all up and down the Queensland coastline. And so, uh, as many of you would know, usually with monocultural cropping, there are a lot of environmental issues created with that kind of method of farming. And the sugarcane industry uh, certainly creates a lot of problems for the Great Barrier Reef. Here's an example um, of something that's fairly typical um, in the that this part of the world, like in Mexico, there's a wet season and a dry season. And in the wet season, you get huge rains falling down and there's uh, a, a, a planting or a crop of monoculture sugarcane there. And the water runs into that and picks up all of the uh, a lot of the chemicals that are within the crop as well as the sediments in the soil and they um, they, they flow out to sea um, into into the Great Barrier Reef which is adjacent to uh, to the to the farmland and there's a there's a lot of discussion about you know the real culprit of what is is causing the Great Barrier Reef to decline in its health and obviously that's climate change because the uh, global sea temperatures are rising which kill the corals just to keep it simple but what happens when when these chemicals flow out into the um, into the coral sea is that this particular um, starfish, which is a, a which is a natural kind of predator in the on the Great Barrier Reef, they actually love those the uh, excess nitrogen and potassium and potassium that flow out into the sea, and they proliferate. They explode in numbers, and they eat the coral. So this is where the farming, where farming plays a role in the health of the Great Barrier Reef is. And so the sugarcane industry is contributing to the problem of the decline of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, so we'll tell a few stories, I guess, about our relationships with farmers next. The, the, the problem of the, um, of the bleaching of the coral in the Great Barrier Reef is, so, is such a big problem that... Um, you know the possibility of some artists coming in to make major changes to it is unrealistic but we did enjoy with this project that it was probably the most challenging project we've ever worked on because of its scale because of this the huge amount of land and our approach was to work at a small scale with particular communities to make it manageable and to have good relationships and connections building over the three or four years of the project this is a significant relationship we had with Simon Matson, who's a sugarcane farmer. And uh, shout out to Simon if you're in the audience out there. He might be there. He might be joining us today. Um, and we, through John Sweet, who'd invited us there, uh, through the various connections, we met Simon. And we had strong affinities with Simon. He's like an artist. He's got amazing ideas. He gets excited about innovations. He wants to share those ideas with other people. He wants to bring people together um, so that they can, uh, other farmers can pick up on those innovations and then he wants to communicate to the broader public. So we saw lots of connections between ourselves and our work as artists and, and Simon's work as a farmer. Hmm. And here we are um, in one of the multi-species crop uh, fields on Simon's farm and we're talking to farmers. And these farmers are part of a, a, a soil health network called the Central Queensland Soil Health Systems. And they gather and they talk about regenerative agriculture systems. And so that was our, our main focus in the beginning of this project was about bringing um, the small group of farmers who are practising regenerative agriculture in the, in the region that we were working in, bringing them into the public realm. And, and so, um, yeah, go yeah. on. I was just going to say we're, what we're standing in there, um, it looks a bit like a, 
you know, a messy bunch of plants, but it's actually, it's a sugarcane crop with a multiple different species planted in amongst the sugarcane. So there's legumes in there and sunflowers and other kinds of things. And um, in the sugarcane industry, um, this is pretty novel or a bit radical. Um, and the idea is that by planting multiple different species together, you build the health of the soil, which then means that it needs fewer chemicals, fewer fertilizer, and so on and so forth. So it's it's good uh, environmentally. And what uh, what Simon discovered in the course of his uh, extensive experiments with multi species cropping was that by planting sunflowers in tandem with with sugarcane, was that they. Um, uh, they were very compatible plants and the, the sunflowers grew very quickly and shaded out a lot of the weeds that might otherwise grow in the uh, in the sugarcane crop. But then what emerged was that sunflowers also had a very big aesthetic appeal and uh, that leads us on to uh, an event. So we, we sort of brainstormed some ideas and Simon had held a kind of agricultural uh, cultural slash agricultural event on his farm in the previous year and we decided that we'd work together and scale it up and make a large public event and this event was called Sunset Symphony in the Sunflowers so the idea was to draw people into the centre of uh, this crop this mixed crop of sunflowers and sugarcane and give the audience a cultural experience while at the same time learning about different types of approaches to agriculture. Yeah, so um, we actually have a little excerpt from a video documentary. So you'll get to see Simon and Kim and, and I um, in the place itself speaking about this event that we're working towards called Sunset Symphony and Sunflowers. So hopefully this will work. Let me just see if I can make this happen. If I switch over to the video here, does it do that? looks like it might be a bit laggy or do i need to stop sharing and start again with a different tab i'll try that okay so hopefully we'll have the video coming up now there we are and hopefully you can please someone let me know if the audio is not coming through clearly Farmers like Simon are working to increase carbon in soils, improving water retention, maintaining plant cover, reducing tillage to minimise erosion and utilising mulch on top of the ground. Climate change has been a much discussed issue and Simon feels that farmers can play a role. The potential for agriculture to influence climate change is, high, is basically unrecognised and certainly by most people dismissed. So that, that potential, I think, is, is yet to be tapped. Being someone who comes from a more urban environment, I'm aware of the disconnection that we have with where the, the agricultural products we consume come from. And so it's easy to therefore um, blame farmers for um, environmental damage that is caused that we are also in urban areas responsible for as consumers. So the stronger the connection that can be made between those urban and rural communities, the better chance we have of coming up collaboratively with solutions for all of us. Simon identified that sunflowers provided a visual appeal and an opportunity to connect people to farmers. The story of, of how our food is produced has slowly over the last five or six decades sort of got lost. It's faded into the background as more and more people have moved out of agriculture and into the city. So today, less than 1% of the Australian population actually actively is actively engaged in agriculture. Back before World War II, most people were either a farmer, knew a farmer, or um, were related to a farmer. So they had that connection. That connection's been lost today. And subsequently, I've been struggling and looking for ways to, to re-establish that connection with agriculture and, and the general public. It really makes me feel happy to be in this field as opposed to the field over there where it's just sugarcane. This just makes me feel alive.
it's it's just bouncing with vitality in comparison to sugarcane alone. It's not that I don't love sugarcane too. Uh, it's what provides the basis of my income. But the sunflowers is what really gives me the bounce. Art has two jobs to do here. One of them is to create a physical space. So it's, it's our role, Kim Williams and I, as artists, as sculptors, to uh, work on the design of the space that the event is staged in as a, as a kind of carved out piece of agricultural uh, architecture. And the other role uh, as someone who works in socially engaged art is to work with a bunch of people locally in the community to bring together um, the possibility of a different kind of social situation. So that is part of our art practice. I've been sculpting for 30 years and I've been doing socially engaged art of one form or another for probably 20, nearly 30 years as well. Sunset Symphony in the Sunflowers is an ideal blend of a, an outdoor public event and a work of land art because what we're doing is carving an amphitheatre in what I already see as a kind of sculptural form. So we're creating a sculptural form within a sculptural form. The considerations for, for this particular event and this particular design are that I wanted to create, I thought that a circle was the obvious thing to do because it, it mimics an amphitheatre, but a, circu a circle is also a very inclusive shape, a very democratic shape. And in terms of the stage, we've had to consider the movement of the sun. So we're facing the stage in a direction where the audience will be able to see the sunflowers front on because the sunflowers face northeast. And also the sun at that time of the day when the event is on won't be in people's eyes. The event embraces the history of South Sea Islanders who've played an integral role in the expansion of Mackay's sugar industry. 2017 is the 150th anniversary of the arrival of the South Sea Islander people to work in the sugarcane industry. And it's a very contested history of uh, forced labor, um, but the, it's important to reconnect with that and acknowledge those kind of troubled labor histories, but also the incredibly positive inter, uh, contributions that the South Sea Islander people have made to this region. We decided that we'd really like to carve this out by hand rather than by machinery because it slows the process down. It gives us time to think and plan as we go along. All right, I'll just pause it there because uh, this is a 13 minute video, but we just wanted to show you a little excerpt. Mm. I'll, I'll go back to our, um, our slideshow. Um, so just a moment. Okay. Go Kim. So hopefully that um, gave you an idea of, of, you know, what our intention was in having this cultural event. And, you know, just to, uh, it was a bit of a Trojan horse in the sense that we had this kind of a jazz band and a symphony orchestra and the cocktails and lovely food grown locally and produced locally. Um, but as the sun set on the event, we had a, a showing of a video and Simon was the farmer was able then to talk about regenerative agriculture and its importance to soil health and its importance more globally and uh, you know to the local and the and the uh, sort of broader ecology. So the the part two of our um, talk today is about what happens next. So up to now um, in this project, Kim and I, who come from like 2,000 kilometres away from this place further south, uh, getting to know the farmers, getting to know the community, learning about uh, the, the South Sea Islander community, just starting to learn about the um, displacement of the Aboriginal community that um, whose land this is and was. 
Um, and so that process continued over a couple more years and we began to um, develop a relationship with the botanic gardens in Mackay. So this uh, second part of our project, we called the Watershed Botanic Gardens Land Art Project. What was really interesting about um, uh, sort of crossing over from the private land of Simon's Farm into a public space was that, of course, it opened out um, the possibility to get more public members because the, the botanic gardens were just on the fringe of the city that we were working, uh, of the region we were working in. And so a lot of people would just pass through this area. And so we were able to make this very public over quite a long time. Um, and, and in order to make this project happen, we had to rec we had to develop re relationships with a lot of different people, and interestingly, what began really as a as an environmental agricultural problem that we were trying to address as artists became it it, it sort of developed an additional focus, which was about the people involved in the sugarcane industry. So when we discovered the um, the South Sea Islander uh, um, involvement in the whole history of sugarcane, of the establishment of the sugarcane industry, and the involvement of the Aboriginal people and the displacement of the Aboriginal people from their land in order to create these sugarcane farms, we realised that it was really, really important for us to actually establish relationships with those very people and begin to bring them together to, to acknowledge the troubled history of sugarcane production in Australia. Yep, so this, these photos are showing... Um... I guess, you know, one of the processes of socially engaged art is sitting down and having lots and lots of cups of tea with people and just allowing the time that it takes to get to know people and build those relationships and build trust without rushing through to some sort of outcome. And so um, that I guess it connects with what um, Carmen and Martina were talking about in Mexico is like a different sort of time scale, uh, time scale of agricultural time, the seasons passing, rather than the idea that, you know, chop, chop, we've got an exhibition to put on by November. Come on, everybody. Um, there's this unfolding that happens over a period of time. And and the collaborative making of this project in um, at the Mackay Botanic Gardens, here's some um, drone photos in process of the crops growing and mulching and so on and so forth. Each of the rituals of planting and harvesting involve people that can come together and participate. So, Kim, on so just looking at the time, we, speaking of time, we don't have a huge amount of time to yep. go into this, but it just gives you a little taste of um, yeah. of that uh, that community involvement in the making of the agricultural crops. What And what um, Carmen and Martina were saying about um, the project containing this kind of embodied activity that using, using the body was a very integral part of the project. Same, it was the same for us in, in that we had active involvement of quite a few um, through through events, but also through volunteers and, you know, these dedicated group of people that um, uh, became an integral part of our project and helped plant, helped maintain, weeded everything. And so this was a kind of work of land art in that it was a circular crop, but it was an active agricultural crop too, a demonstration crop. Mm. And there's some... We, we, Kim and I are very interested in the, the word culture appears in, you know, we talk about culture in art and agriculture has the word culture in it as well. So um, it's a whole other talk, but we could talk about Kim's songwriting prowess and the creation of songs to be played and sung while planting, while harvesting and so on. Um, here's uh, some more work in progress photos. There's two of our really important collaborators, Starrett and... Um, Kelly. Uh, Kelly, um, who worked up in Mackay to um, help make this circular crop of sugarcane and sunflowers a reality. And here's our harvest, sunflower harvest event, which was a wonderful big um, community event where the sunflowers were all chopped down and distributed and made their way out into people's homes. And there was music and there was uh, film screenings and there was food food and everything so it was, it was really fun like a, I guess it taps into those cultural histories of har harvest festivals that kind of thing 
Mm. Once the uh, sunflowers were harvested, that then made way for the sugar cane then to grow up into full maturity, at which point in that kind of cycle of growing and harvesting, the final event that we ran for this project was called Old Ways, New, New Ways. And that's where we made a very deliberate effort to bring all of the cultural groups that were involved in the sugarcane industry together. So that was the Australian South Sea Islander people, the Anglo-Saxon people, the Maltese community, the Italian community, the Uabara Aboriginal people. So everyone came together in this, in this kind of final event and it was wonderful because we saw these old traditions at work as well. So that woman in the photo is, in, is enacting uh, something that they used to do in the old days when uh, the women would bring out uh, drinks at, at um, what's called smoko or morning tea time, which was actually, what was it, a mixture of tea and alcohol, wasn't it? Tea and wine, yes. Tea and wine, yeah. So so it was a really wonderful way of all these communities who hadn't really had much to do with each other for a, a very long time came together and really saw, you know, took a lot of, um, got a great deal from, from that experience. So we should wrap up, but obviously we can talk more yeah. in question time, but um, just to sort of um, reflect on some of our main things that we learned. Um, the differences between working on private land with Simon for Sunset Symphony and the Sunflowers compared to working on public land at the Botanic Gardens, both have their advantages um, in terms of what you, you know, on a farm you can do all sorts of crazy things without asking for permission because the farmer um, wants to make it happen. Uh, in, the, in the public land, by contrast, it's easier for the public to, to wander in and get involved. Um, and also for scientific organisations um, that were environmentally focused on the reef came and used the piece of um, crop, the crop that we had grown as uh, for workshops and for scientific testing and things like that too. Yeah. Okay, um, so we should, um, we've, we should wrap up and um, pass over to um, Jennifer again. Thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you. And big shout out again to Simon. I, I, I confirmed that Simon is in the audience. Hello, Simon. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Kim and Lucas. That was really interesting. Um, I think there's a lot for people to kind of digest at the moment. So um, let's take a five minute break. And then uh, we'll be back with Shi Tan, who will share about his project, followed by Michael. Okay, so let's do five minutes in a moment. See you in a bit.
Hi, we are slowly coming back on. I'm Hello. gonna put everyone on stage. You talk to me, my sir. Okay, Xu Tan. Hi, I'm here. Okay. Uh, hi everyone. I'll just uh do a quick um summary. Uh, kind of uh, like introduction uh, just for people who just can't come, come on. Um, yeah, so this panel today actually is a uh, part of our Bamboo Broadcast Studio um, that's happening at Objectives now in Singapore under Wang Ruoping's Alternative Ecology Program. And uh, today we will have um, artist groups, uh, four artists and artist groups sharing about their projects that's related to um, ecology, art, and food, and specifically with people who grow food. Um, so we've already had two sharings, one by Collectivo Amasi Joe from Mexico, and another one from Kim Williams and Lucas Eileen from Sydney. So um, now we're gonna have a sharing by Shi Tan, and then, from, uh, and then another sharing by Michael, and then at the end, we will have a Q&A, so hold your questions. Um, yeah, so uh, if everything's okay, Shitan, can, do you want to start? No, yeah. okay. <laughs> first. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So uh, at first, I would uh, introduce my friend. He will help me. He's my co cooperator. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, at first, I should say my English is not good. Not good. And... Uh, uh, especially in the, how to say, several years pandemic, I have stayed in China, so I almost forget the, uh, my English. <laughs> no chance to to talk. So so I need need my friend to help. Huh? So uh, Jennifer, I'm now starting to talk, Let's start from here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> actually, um, uh, I spent uh, almost uh, 10 years uh, and more to, to make a, a research, social research and um, art mixed, uh, mix the two things together. Um, I have a project called the Social Botany. Um, that's the research uh, project. So um, now I, I will uh, talk about um, one or two um, branch um, from my this project. Yeah, uh, the first um, in this is uh, in. This is a slide. Slide. How do you use? Uh, present here. Okay, slide. Yeah. Mm. Talk one. one. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, actually um, in 2012 I began to do this project um, uh, at first I, I interview in the countryside and uh, um so I, I just find the um, the pro the big problem is the um, the the agriculture way uh, change a lot the so firstly people now um, people um, plan the plants they're using the industrial seeds yeah uh. Yeah. yeah. So I interview some um, farmer. They say I bought all the seeds to of my plants, everything. Uh, um, and that because only several one um, of my pro plants can can leave the seeds for the next generation. No, normally, um, 
maybe hundreds um, plants. All of these things, uh, the seeds just buy from the market, from the that's industrial product production. Yeah, yeah. Um, ah, this is how to use it. This. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Just, just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so these people sometimes they will plant the the beans. So they using using the natural seeds. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, um, this uh, how to say the 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 upper, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, the upper the uh, the, the first, um, the first image one. Uh, first one. It's about the social uh, um, or the, uh, about the city and the and the countryside uh, industry um, uh, development. You you know in China, um, if we every year they need a lot of the new plants for the new um, how to say the uh, new road. You you say new road. A new road. Yeah, the countryside and also the, um, the cities, um, the the building, uh, development. Uh, huh? develop yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, all these uh, trees, um, um, how to say industrial um, production. Yeah, and. Uh, Actually, no yeah, 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 yeah. Actually, actually, uh, this the how is the 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 photo? If um, that's about my project in the Rotterdam, Rotterdam in Holland. So I interview um, uh, organic, uh, organic the um, uh, farming. Um, how to say place so in um but the the seeds is, is a still problem they um the the uh, how to say the gentleman show me the uh um, tomato tomato uh, tomatoes they they talk about um the seeds is from the also buy they bought the seeds so I, I say, if you using the next generation of this tomato, what will happen? They say um, it's problem. Yeah, maybe uh, sometime nothing will will plant. Uh, maybe will go, the tomato will go back to the parents' generation. Yeah. So this is a change a lot about our Chinese. Uh, traditional value, huh? um, I mean, I mean, this thing happened in China. So in China now, people still. Uh, I mean, in the ancient time, the traditional time, people like to originally. Um, Flood, huh? Flood. Flood. <coughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, the um, um, I mean, so sometimes I say, um, if everything surround us is changed, how can you keep your blood very pure or something? Um, this is a how to say a, a <laughs> problem, huh? uh, and uh, um, after that, I I. Sure. I, I made another project called uh, 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 when my mother lost in the um, forest. Who is talking to her? Yeah. Um, I this this project uh, was uh, is about my interview in four uh, in several countries in the eastern. Asia country, yeah, um, in Japan, in Singapore, in, and also in the. Um, so this project I show four uh, four stories. Uh, 
uh, this the first first is um, I interview a um, um, scientist. Uh, he, he, he's a he's a director of the um, botanic park in um, Kyoto. Uh, he talk about the um, a lot of thing about the the plants, how plants um, in their the 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 garden the the park um, talk about the religion um, what's the relation between the religion and the um, and the plants talk about what's the difference um, how to say the plants with the different religion the relation ah. Uh, in the uh, in the how is the Christian? How about the Japanese religion and also the Buddhism? I, I, I talk about a lot of that that thing, and um, the second uh, is I, I I interview somebody a, a farmer in in Canton the um, countryside. Uh, he talk about someday uh, he. he his mother disappeared in the forest, and um, uh, he called uh, call on for hundred people to uh, look for his mother. But uh, after twenty four hours, her his mother um, appear again. Yeah, the <clears throat> the third story is about the. Uh, uh, I interview people in uh, one 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 Chinese uh, American American Chinese uh, in San Francisco. Uh, he talked about uh, his story um, several years ago. Uh, his father passed away. He feels so sad. He cannot work. He's a, uh, actually he's a architect. He graduated from the Berkeley University. His master, yeah. Um, um for the reason of the uh, father passed away he cannot work and uh, some friends um uh how to say Chen advised Chen, Chen, uh, advised uh, uh, him to plan some uh something in in yard so he 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 planned some vegetable uh in the father's yard and when the the vegetable grow up from the land, he feel he just feel change him a lot. He feel his father's energy is calm. So then he became an active activist of the society, social activist. Um, <clears throat> he. Um, for uh, Auckland, uh, the the town uh, close to the San Francisco is Auckland. Uh, in this Guangchang, uh, uh, square. Uh, square. Uh, so the government and want want to change the square to be a subway, just a detail. Subway Shanghai. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, they want to build a lot of thing and. Uh, um, uh, how to finish this this square? But in the uh, last hundred, the more uh, one and two hundred years, a lot of the people, mostly um, the American Chinese, they every morning uh, they to do the exercise there. So um, the, this guy, I mean, he say he can see the the life before him. The energy of them uh, still there. <laughs> he he just um, make a movement to protect the square. They say, oh, the, um, the government and the development uh, developer, they cannot see the um, the energy of the people before us. So they want to destroy the square. So so they they. So many people um, come to him and uh, and uh, protect the um, how do you say the square and then the success. Government um, say yes, yes, you can keep it. Yeah. 
So uh, and um, and um, and very very interesting things. He really feel um, his father's energy and um, is is still there. And uh, he say he sometimes he bring his 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 kids to to the square. He say I feel I just wanted to let my kids to know my father. Huh. Um, I just say you really feel that he said yes. So I, I mean, um, okay, we, we we should talk about the the fourth story is uh, from Singapore. Um, uh, Jennifer know the lady. Um, this lady, uh, his name is um, Lee Annie. Huh? Uh, he, uh, um, uh, he's also. Very interesting. He uh, he said there are a lot of the restaurants here, and um, they waste a lot of the how to say the part of the vegetable to the to the garbage to the uh, like this, like uh, yeah. And sometimes he, uh, she, and a friend to uh, to keep to pick it up, pick this kind of the. Vegetable and uh, eat it, and then he drunk too much. How do you say? Drunk too much. How do you say? Uh, poignant. Poignant. Yeah, poignant. Uh, poisoned. Poignant. Ah, uh, poisoned. Uh, poisoned. He got poisoned, and um, uh, because um, how do you say? People uh, leave a lot of the medicine, just lao shu yao. How do you say? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. yeah, on the street, people um, get sick. Get sick. Uh, yeah, get, uh, she gets sick. Uh, sick because a lot of the um, poison the thing maybe in the, in this garbage. Uh, so and she also um, um, uh, how to say plan some 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 something uh, you can see on the street. Um, she say now I interview her. She cannot uh, stand for sit for a long time. She has to lie down. Yeah, uh, it, uh, she inter. Uh, how do you say? Introduce. Uh, introduction. Uh, introduction. A lot of the the plans she planned. She say she can really um, feel the plants. Uh, emotion. Uh, emotion, yeah, emotion. So, yeah, and um, she said she likes some Kuang Kuang Gong Li, uh, Kuang Kuang Ye Li. Maybe Jennifer, you should say <laughs> you know her much more than me, huh? Yeah, um, she. How to say? Um, I really respect her because she, she you know, how to say, the health health. Um, he using this for. She say she like the, quang quang 里面的那种那种鸟，金翅鸟，怎么说？啊。Um, I'm I'm so sorry. Um, I cannot say. You can say just end some animal. Yeah, so, so yeah, yeah. So uh, I show this. Um, I mean, why? Um, I mean, uh, from this, um, um, just the, from the research. Uh, uh, I just feel. Um, um, what what is the uh, special? Value. I, I mean, uh, in the I say the East Asian uh, people, although with although uh, the scientists, um, they are how to say they believe the science, but also in the same time they believe the local um, belief. They were mixed, uh, like like this uh, the 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 Japanese scientist. Uh, um, 植物学植物学家怎么说？啊 ，botanist 是吧 ？botanist 那植植物的
，植物学家，植物学家，嗯。Botanist, uh, botanist. Um, he say he has some special experience. He talk about the experience. Uh, he say, uh, sometime, um, three times she he feel the trees talk to her to him. He really feel that. Um, um, so this is a. Uh, some 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 uh, some day uh, in a, in the evening uh, in a, in a deep night he finished work just uh, he uh, he how to say sit down uh, um, outside I feel the tree talk to her to him oh you come to uh, how are you or something yeah he he say he has a this kind of the experience for three times so I think. This is really、um, in the same time he believed、um, science should be very important for、uh, for the future. Yeah,、um, and uh, and uh, this guy, this is a Chinese Chinese、um, farmer. He say,、um, yeah, he just his mother disappeared and come come out again, and、uh, they search, look for his mother for one day. In the,、um, the place where his mother come out,、um, how to appear? They they come there many many times, but just nothing.、Um, I say that they have a one hundred. There are one hundred people. How do you say? Look for, look for his mother, but his mother just come, come back by herself. Then. 就自自然的出来出现的啊 ，natural， 呃 ，naturally come back。So， <笑>我觉得这很像平行世界。<笑>你你帮我说一下啊。嗯、uh, ，like like、um, 大声一点，要不然听不见。呃、uh, ，it's like a a um another world for with with the reality。Yeah， this is just happening in the countryside。Yeah， this is。Uh, something、uh, related to the ancient Chinese culture.、Um, yeah, sometimes you you will feel this is also related to the very contemporary science. <laughs> I think、um, this is, I mean, the the East Asian like Chinese or Japanese or that this they have a they sometimes they can they can keep two value system together. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, the botanic botanist he say, why in the、um, uh, Christian church no big trees, but in the Japanese、uh, temple there are very high trees.、Uh, trees, they say because the God come down, just the 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 feet will、uh, how to say, 脚踏的那个树怎么下说呀，脚踏呀脚。Step, yeah. Step, step.、Uh, the God step, step down. We need the high trees. Yeah, this is a scientist's word. The he said, ah,、huh? um, um, so and also uh, uh, this is also、um, how to say the、um, uh, architect, architect,、uh, and also very high educated. He also believe his father's energy will come. With the、um, vegetable, so、um, yeah, and also then he 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 became a, a revolutionary and、uh, <laughs> to do some okay、uh, protect for the, the square or something. Yeah,、um, of course.、Um, uh, I'm sorry, my 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 English is so、uh, so bad. I cannot. Actually, if in Chinese I can talk more, <laughs> I, I want. I say,、uh, I would like to finish now. Ah,、uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, Shitan, you you did well. I think it was good. Yeah. Uh, we can continue later. Um, I think maybe we should move on to to Michael. Are you ready? Uh, put you on stage, Michael. Yeah,、uh, give me a moment. Ah,、uh. let me. Okay, Shitan, let me put you out first of the stage. And Michael. Okay, there you yeah, go. Yeah, I'm、okay, here. Okay, I'm gonna get.
Okay. Well, I hope everyone can hear me and see my my slides. Okay. So yeah, I'll I'll start now. Uh, thank you everyone for the invitation and everyone working behind the scenes. I really enjoyed listening to all those different stories, experiences, and yeah, the the common threads such as uh, reacting to invitations from different community members. I think yeah, this is really integral. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope uh, I could share um, similar stories that are happening in Hong Kong right now. Um, so yeah, for those of you that are familiar with this fruit, um, this is the jackfruit. And uh, I'll try and uh, speak Mike, through Mike, the jackfruit. Um, Mike, Michael. Uh, oh, yeah, can you hear me? I cannot see your screen. Oh, no. Yeah. OK, wait, wait, it's coming back. Uh, oh, how about I now? Only... Yes, OK, that's good. OK, you, I think I can't go full screen. Yeah, OK. okay. <laughs> All right, I won't go full screen. But um, yeah, feel free to go full screen on your side, everyone. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, I'll, I'll talk about jackfruit relations and how um, they relate to ecology and uh, resistance and uh, village evictions in Hong Kong. And uh, first I'll speak about the general geography of Hong Kong. Uh, as some of you know, uh, Hong Kong was a former British colony. Um, there's an area in the northern part of Hong Kong uh, called the New Territories, uh, which is uh, uh, composed of uh, uh, mountains, uh, rural farms, and also uh, very much urbanized. And uh, I'll be mostly spoke, speaking about Fun Ling up here and uh, Yun Long uh, in the northwest. Um, so starting in Fun Ling, this one that happened in 2016, um, where property developers acquired land, purchased land from indigenous uh, villagers, and are now building high rise. Uh, luxury apartments and infrastructure um, on this piece of farmland now and I want to um, yeah talk about this point in relation to the invitation um, sadly this was a unsuccessful resistance um, but there were simultaneous village struggles that were happening in Hong Kong and in 2017 uh, the village in the northwest of Hong Kong uh, invited us, uh, us being the villagers, farmers, and also uh, supporters, um, to uh, share uh, our experiences of what happened um, in Fun Leng um, on this farmland that you see here. And I, yeah, I also want to acknowledge um, that uh, there are common struggles around the world. At the time, I recall uh, Grow Heathrow. Um, which was a land squat um, just next to Heathrow Airport, resisting the third runway, uh, was also yeah going through some eviction issues and sadly later uh, got evicted as well. And so yeah, now to jump to Yun Long in the northwest uh, on an invitation from the villagers there. Uh, we went there in 2017 um, to, to learn from the villagers uh, what the government was planning um, uh, in that region. And you can see this kind of jagged uh, shaped outline over here. That was at the time the government's proposed uh, development zone um, to essentially evict 500 villagers um, and destroy 1,032 trees and uh, natural habitats to build um, 17,000 public housing units, um, which was later uh, significantly reduced to 4,000. Um, so there are many reasons uh, for this reduction and the government also proposed a series of phases. Um, and 
what I want to say is it's it, it was difficult at the time to get a critical mass because, uh, as you know, property prices are uh, uncontrollable in Hong Kong and uh, many people require public housing. Uh, there is actually a shortage and the average wait is around six years um, at least. Um, so, yeah, the government chose to evict uh, 500 villagers um, to build those public housing units. So, yeah, at the time, uh, the villagers had already started organizing from 2015, the Wan Chao villagers. And as I said, uh, friends and I joined in 2017, and there were already remnants uh, in the city, uh, sorry, in the village, um, relating to their struggle. And this was a white banner that was faded from the sunlight which read that the government is a thief robbing the land. And this was this banner was, I guess, testament to that already two year plus struggle. And um, yeah, there were many of these traces around the village at the time. Uh, so yeah, here was the, the phase, the three phases that the government initially uh, proposed. And now um, they are only working with phase one. Um, there were neoliberal entanglements as well. Um, so if you can see my cursor, the left part of this development here on the, the west side of the development zone, uh, that was acquired by a property developer called New World Development, um, also purchased from indigenous villagers and New World were and were or still are planning to build um, free high rises, uh, luxury apartments. And there were instances where engineering consultants were both working for New World as well as the government and exchanging um, information so as to better both of their proposals. And one of them was to build this road, which would eventually go to New World's development. Uh, built with taxpayers' money. So, um, yeah, despite, um, uh, yeah, these these happenings that were uh, being planned in the city, um, oftentimes I was always, always thinking what else is going on, um, what other entanglements are there, also relating to colonial policies that were left over by... Um, the British colonial government. Um, so as uh, an outsider, um, I spent time with the villagers and the support concern group. And uh, as an artist, I, I helped by creating some infographics to help communicate um, what's happening in the village and what the villagers have been um, doing and resisting and the, the forms of um, resistance uh, towards the government's development plan, such as street petitioning, um, street protests, um, uh, press conferences, etc. And during that meeting uh, of the two villages uh, from Fanlang and Wan Chao, uh, we spoke about, um, I guess, characteristics of Wan Chao and what, what's very unique about um, the village itself. And one concerned group member mentioned that there are many jackfruit trees, um, which um, yeah, are spread all around, all around the village. So here you could see um, each year the village can harvest around over 300 jackfruits. And it's worth noting that these jackfruits were never sold. They're always part of a gift economy and shared freely um, between the villagers. So for those of you who are interested to see, um, yeah, the forms of organizing, you could have a look at the Facebook group, uh, Wan Chao Green. And the development zone is actually part of a green belt. Um, so another uh, I guess, colonial form of zoning, the green belt being a buffer between the city and the uh, natural landscape. So due to um, a shortage of housing um, in the 1950s uh, and the following decades, 
um, villagers would self-build their homes uh, embedded uh, inside the green belt, like this home over here, surrounded by trees. And uh, yeah, uh, in 2017, I saw this particular tree cultivated uh, by Mr. Ho. And at the time, there were around 94 jackfruits, uh, which is yeah, a really amazing yield from one tree. Um, um, other villagers that I met were Miss Cheng here on the right, um, who was always very welcoming, uh, sharing her different plants, medicinal plants, fruit trees, uh, vegetables in her garden. And also, yeah, welcoming um, uh, arts and ecology um, bachelor um, arts course uh, to come and uh, visit her garden. And here she is, uh, yeah, lifting up some ginger. And I was able uh, to also, um, uh, in relation to the jackfruit, uh, to learn how they, uh, Mrs. Cheng and her husband, uh, harvested uh, jackfruits from very high up in the tree. Um, instead of climbing, they would create uh, this huge net, which will is laid out horizontally, and her husband will. Uh, use an extended saw and the, the net will kind of, uh, I guess, cradle <laughs> or break the fall of the jackfruit, which is uh, sometimes around 10 kilograms in weight, super heavy. Another villager that I work closely with uh, now is Miss Cheng. And here we are uh, with a, a large harvest of jackfruits in preparation um, for a jackfruit uh, festival. And uh, when I yeah, think about um, those years of organizing, um, I really cherish these moments when um, supporters and members of the concern group and villagers, um, we crouch around one jackfruit and spend probably around 15, to 30 minutes um, just opening the jackfruit and having just a uh, chit chat and uh, meeting and learning from each other. So yeah, in this particular situation, they were um, researchers um, from different NGOs, um, supporters and students, etc. cetera. Um, another villager um, that I met um, who has a bone setting, traditional bone setting practice is Mr. Lam. And here he is with his signage, um, which is, yeah, very visible um, from the roadside um, to his village house where he runs his clinic. Um, so yeah, as an artist, um, I was, yeah, um, able to, I guess, do creative gestures and, and one uh, followed from this village tour that I I joined um, that was led by a villager called Patrick at the time. And I remember a leaflet that they passed around to all the participants and one of them showed um, these different points of the village such as um, the different villages and um, a well, um, a kind of wind pavilion. And I remember seeing this image and being slightly confused that it looked more like a subway map or like a metro map. So I kindly suggested um, if I could like help by painting a village map, which um, the villagers really uh, welcomed. So in, in preparation um, for a public event uh, called the Wan Chao Jackfruit Festival, uh, I painted um, this map here, which was used as part of the village tours later and also communicated some of the villagers' plight, um, such as um, advocating a democratic planning um, towards um, yeah, public housing and uh, focusing on the urban-rural coexistence as opposed to destroying a green belt. And this was the Jackfruit Festival, the uh, in 2017, 
um, it was in the public park underneath a bridge, which was, um, yeah, a bridge for the Metro link. And it was, yeah, it was very well attended, uh, despite there being a typhoon three in the morning, or typhoon eight, I think, number eight, relatively strong. Um, so at the Jackfruit Festival, Miss Chang uh, shared her produce freely, uh, including aloe vera, um, lemongrass, ginger, fish leaf as well, medicinal plants as well. And there was an opportunity for um, other marginalized communities um, in the city, such as fabric sellers that were relocated last year by the government to also have exchanges with the villagers. And this was at the village entrance. Um, that was a self-built structure um, as a way to engage um, villagers who um, were unsure about um, the government's eviction and uh, proposal development plan. Um, so yeah, this, this is an image of some villagers um, building a barricade, which was, um, I think it was in 2018. Uh, they built three barricades at three different village entrances, essentially um, preventing the lands, um, the lands department, um, yeah, the government officers um, from coming into the village. Um, I guess, yeah, other forms of um, organizing uh, villagers and the concern group um, wrote their stories and created this publication, which was launched at um, a major book fair in Hong Kong. And there's other printed matter as well, such as this Furushiki cloth, which says, um, stay rooted uh, in Wan Zhao. Uh, so surprisingly, um, the inaugural Jackfruit Festival ended up becoming um, four uh, over yeah over four years. Uh, we expected the eviction to happen after the first one, but perhaps through uh, public pressure, um, the support of legislative councillors and the media, um, the villagers were able to prolong the eviction across four uh, Jackfruit Festivals and the last one being in 2020 over here. And yeah, working with uh, Miss Cheng, who I mentioned earlier, the, the, the villager that I harvested jackfruits with, um, she also done a lot of documentation, uh, photographing um, 53 varieties of medicinal plants in the village. And this is, uh, yeah, from her computer. Uh, she took all the photographs, and uh, done the design uh, on her computer. And uh, we found an uh, illustrator friend, uh, Ting Chak Lam, to do the front cover and a calligrapher, John Yu, to yeah, write the medicinal herbs um, book um, title. And yeah, publishing is a uh, very, uh, I guess, important part of my practice and yeah, I was really happy um, to see that Ms. Cheng uh, yeah, also feels the same way, the, the possibilities and the importance of yeah, sharing uh, stories from the village as well as different species as well. Um, so a couple of years ago, uh, yeah, as you can see um, through the early COVID years, um, there were some farmers markets where Miss Cheng and I would often just set up these market stores selling um, different plants, uh, curry leaves, um, curry leaf trees, aloe vera, Cuban oregano, and I would um, sell some zines and uh, yeah, other texts uh, next to her. And right now uh, we're working on um, perhaps future zines uh, in relation to different species that uh, are in the village, uh, such as this long-tailed skink and also um, yeah, other insects as well. Uh, around two years ago, um, in the same exhibition uh, with uh, Colectivo Amasillo, uh, we were invited um, to join an exhibition in Seoul and on invitation, uh, Miss Chang uh, 
wrote a short text uh, in relation to the eviction of her house. And um, yeah, uh, she also included some some tiles that she um, salvaged from the excavator. And uh, this was made into a, a zine, uh, which was included in the exhibition. And it, yeah, it's important to also, I guess throughout the years, it was, it was the government used a lot of their own terminology. They had their own lexicon of, I guess, lexicon of coloniality, um, which um, further marginalize, marginalizes the, the villagers and uh, their daily life and where their homes are. And this is a, a quote from a Singapore historian, Lo Ka Seng, uh, who talks about this, um, this state intervention, um, imposing these words uh, on a community such as squatter. So yeah, this was uh, Miss, Miss Cheng's ho uh, home just before the eviction. Um, the exhibition that I mentioned in Seoul, um, showing yeah, different texts as well as the medicinal herb scene that Miss Cheng worked on. And uh, last year, um, I wrote uh, a thesis novel uh, called Three Villages, A Wang Chao Story, which uh, includes um, a lot of the organizing and um, uh, multi-species um, ethnography and different stories um, that emerged during the, the resistance. And uh, one part, one extract, looks, tries to, um, tries to work out why there was an abundance of jackfruits in the village. And it might be owing to um, a farm uh, that was purchased in 1932 by uh, Tildell family um, who cultivated a piece of land that was 80 hectares uh, in size and turned it into a fruit, fruit orchard uh, with over a thousand trees. And this land became, uh, I guess, part of uh, a network um, of refugees and those who uh, wanted to earn English. Um, Low-income families uh, could go to school here and get free lunches and breakfasts. And this was just a stone's throw away from uh, where Miss, Miss Cheng's house was. Uh, the thesis novel also uh, tells the story of activists um, who made their own signage um, to attach to trees that were um, scheduled to be failed by the Hong Kong government, such as this sign here, remove the lands department, not trees. It tells stories of performance artists who came to the village, such as Iro here, um, who spent, uh, yeah, around 20 minutes um, trying to climb uh, this tree over here, um, but being unsuccessful. And this was uh, part of the Jackfruit Festival in 2020. Um, there are different perspectives in the novel that include uh, the lanternfly perspective. Uh, this lanternfly uh, being an insect that is rather um, solitary and uh, oftentimes found on long and trees and jackfruit trees, uh, drinking the, the juicy sap from the tree, as well as multi-species encounters between beetles and wasps and hornets, uh, or feasting on uh, wax apples. Um, this is a tree that's still standing on the, on the edge of the um, destruction zone. Uh, corpse flowers as well, which emerged um, only in the, the, last, the last year of the eviction. Um, the family who, whose garden this, this grew in, um, they had never seen it before, like living in their home for 60 years. Um, it decided to emerge in the last year. And uh, this is a recent exhibition um, in San Francisco. 
uh, also a collaboration with Miss Chang and um, a friend called Nancy Liu. Uh, together, we're part of a group called Wan Chao Tin Yun on Instagram. And this is a documentation of, uh, yeah, the, the resistance uh, during those years, as well as videos by uh, news medias that sadly no longer exist. And this is an illustration uh, highlighting other villages in Hong Kong that are scheduled for eviction as well. Um, it's, it's a list uh, perhaps that could be uh, inspiring to other people who want to support these limited uh, green spaces uh, that will later sadly be uh, yeah, very concretized. And yeah, I hope uh, yeah, these types of images can can also yeah illuminate um, those villager stories as well. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. I'd like to yeah just finish and share a quote from uh, Hala Alayan, a Palestinian poet and writer, um, in relation to um, yeah being in solidarity for those. Uh, to those who are marginalized and dispossessed. Um, solidarity is how we reaffirm existence. So yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, I look forward to our Q&A session. Okay, yeah. thanks Michael. I'm gonna add everyone back onto the stage. Okay, Shitan. <laughs> I'm adding everyone back onto the stage so that we can have this session. And um, do you want to start? Do you have any responses to each other? Maybe we can start with that. Uh, wait, let me try to... Okay, I think you have to... Yeah, nobody wants to respond to anything that someone else has said. I know there's some some responding going on in the comments already. Uh, yeah, you have to unmute yourself. I can't unmute you for some um, reason. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thanks, everyone. You, all your work is so interesting, and I'm I'm kind of interested in, in the... Um, we didn't show you slides of... Um, so one one part of our project in for Sugar versus the Reef was to have quite a, a significant exhibition at the local regional gallery in Mackay, and there was that um, we brought in farmers into the gallery, and and you were talking about that earlier, I think, Carmen and Martina, about people who normally don't go to galleries coming into the gallery, and I'm guess I'm just wanting to ask you about that sort of. Um, how you go about your social practice and then in your case, Michael, and in your case, um, Xi, translating that across into a gallery practice. Does that question make sense, you know, that that how, how you kind of um, uh, translate what you're doing in communities across into art galleries and whether you see those two as, as the same uh, and whether you um, can, whether your intention is to bring people across those two environments. Mm -hmm. um, but see, I, it, I think it's a very good question and something that we always say is like, we are not in the gallery spaces because of the white cube. We are in the spaces of the gallery because of the power structure that represent those spaces, no? So it's mm -hmm. taking advantage of the institution and putting the institution with power, uh, uh, working for the people who, for us, need the most to be here. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for the question. I think it's mm -hmm. a really good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I could just uh, share a little bit. Um, it's always slightly uncomfortable to, to think about how our collective work can exist 
um, in a white space. Um, but I also see it as like another form of engagement um, with people who perhaps don't have the time um, to go to the village or even have those relations. Um, yeah, I mean, the, for example, our, the village tours weren't, weren't that often. Sometimes they were easily fill up. Um, so the exhibition space uh, just offer, offers a different encounter and um, yeah, friends and I try to make it as comfortable as possible, <laughs> like with stalls, so and um, translations, uh, subtitles for the videos, um, so that people can really spend time with those materials. Um, and it's another way of, um, I guess, um, yeah, thinking about how like. We want to tell the story. For example, Miss Chang um, decided to write a text, um, and those materials can exist after the exhibition, which are really important as well. Thank you. Do you have other responses to each other at the moment? Okay. No, for me, it's like really, so if, if I can make like a whole, like this, this manifestation of, of how stories are like the powerful that remains, no? At, at the end, like, like the, the story of, of, of how the plant make somebody think about or, or relate to, to to the father that was dead or or that Mrs. Shang's stories still remains. Nothing is there, but the stories are there. Or the story of the land in, in, in Australia, you know, that, that it's growing there and it's a, the land who's telling the stories, no? So how can we, this is one of my questions, no? How can we really share these stories in, in a way that, that people start thinking through stories and, and not through facts, no? Like, like this is always like, maybe that's something that, that be, because of art or because of literature or because of whatever you call it, we have to, of poetry maybe, how to, to become use of, of, of keep on going through stories and not through facts and, and, infographics and, and, and media. No, I don't know. It's like this. I was thinking about like I, 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 what remains about all of these are the stories that were told here. No, So it's something that is a commentary, but also a question. Um, yeah, I, I think I agree with you there. Um, and I think it's interesting in all our examples is um, there is uh, a role of the artist as somebody who is learning something here, like the artist as a kind of a student, um, the farmer or the community member as a teacher. And uh, there's a certain kind of humility that is present in all of the projects here today um, where that kind of cultural encounter between artist and farmer or community member um, the artist is not really ever in a position of teaching as much as as learning and then through that process of learning uh, sharing that process with a wider audience Yeah, if I may. Yeah, I really yeah agree with that comment, like learning with those community members. And yeah, despite like the village not existing, um, through um, documentation, 
uh, and looking through old photos and different species, I'm reminded that there's still so much more to learn as well. Um, yeah, like for example, the, the corpse flower, <laughs> I, I don't know much about it and why it decided to emerge um, during the last year. Um, also, yeah, the, the skink as well. Um, how that can survive, yeah, a very violent uh, eviction as well as the lantern fly. Um, what I really liked looking at, like for our projects, was the scale as well um, that span like long distances um, in Mexico um, to, yeah, creating space in. Um, cultivated land, like in in, 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 uh, in the sunflower um, farm. And also, yeah, Chotan's really personal connection, with just one-on-one, -on -one, um, one -on -one scale, which is, yeah, really important. And uh, yeah, illuminating and centering those, those voices. Um, yeah. Hi. I have a question for everyone about um, duration because, um, at, you know, projects begin at some point somehow and, I mean, for you, Michael, and for you, um, Carmen and Martina, your projects are ongoing. Is that right? Um, do you see that at some point there would be an end to what you're doing? And, and if that's the case, how you would go about, um, you know, drawing the project to a close? Um, I think for us, we are searching and also interwin moment with the community of Milpalta. Uh, in a way, um, o sea, they are, o sea, the food that we are eating come from them. The, o sea, everything our life is is now involved involved to uh, with them, no. So, for me, it's very hard to think about a uh, uh, ending to that. O sea, it's like the food that I'm eating every day, no. And and also, I think it's, sí, o sea, it's this continu continuity of of growing food that. And of course, a lot of uh, of there is a lot of problem happening. No, like we are uh, facing a very big drought, drought, drought. Mm -hmm. drought. Yep. Uh -huh. But also, then it's like how, o sea, thanks to this closeness, it's like how can we start to research the drought, or how can we start to uh, search for narrative of the older people who knows about the drought, because, o sea, and it's also something about not this. Oh, I I'm, I have to be with them because I need to fight this because now I cannot eat food that is not coming from them. O sea, I I know what a real tortilla tastes. I know what a real quelite tastes. O sea, mm. I cannot go back to supermarket food. Mm. O sea, in a way, it's because of of the love of my mouth to that food, no? O sea, and also a friendship, no? You there is like this friendship that it's it's there that is not like yeah. it's, yes. It, you cannot end it. So yes. it's like it's, it's a continuous transformation and it's in continued, it, it became really complex, no? So, so you are yes. like part, see, you're, you are just now like 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 a very yes. bond situation. Yes. So, so no, it, it, we are like transforming each other through the relationship. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, great question, Kim. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, I oftentimes don't really think about these these collaborations as projects, but more, yeah, it's just ongoing, ongoing collaborative work, friendship, as as uh, yeah, you said earlier, um, and. I think in relation to the jackfruit, um, after the 2020 Jackfruit Festival um, with Miss Chang and others, um, we've also been organizing 
like an annual jackfruit gathering. Um, uh, so there are, um, yeah, villagers who have, still have access um, to jackfruit trees and jackfruit harvests. And uh, in the past couple of years, we've had different types of workshops such as uh, jackfruit tree dyeing workshops. Um, so jackfruit trees that were sadly felled, uh, we kept some of those logs, the trunks, and have uh, used them uh, as part of dyeing workshops. And also last year, um, we organized the gathering um, in the, uh, yeah, the urban environment um, in the collective space. And this also gave a chance for villagers uh, concerned group members and supporters to come together and yeah talk about life after eviction uh, cats that they adopted from the village uh, share those types of stories and also um, to gather around the jackfruit and open it collectively um, which is yeah really enjoyable um, and yeah I guess um, the last slide where I showed these illustrations of hands and string figures and different villages. Um, there are other villages that uh, we're in contact with. Uh, some of them have artists actually living in the village, which, <laughs> yeah, makes it really, um, yeah, easy to engage. Um, they're able to, yeah, introduce us to their neighbors. And um, there are overlaps. I remember one gathering uh, last year where villagers from, yeah, free, um, I guess, uh, unstable or destined for eviction villages came together um, and made lanterns uh, during mid-autumn festival. And just to have that sort of alliance of free villages just momentarily coming together um, for village tour and um, an art workshop yeah, it's really special. And yeah, hopefully there'll be more of those relations to come. Thank you, Michael. Do you want to do you want to talk about how you came to be doing these projects and whether what you've learned or experienced have actually been what you expected yeah or how do you deal with pushback maybe from you know farmers or pushback that like people who are resisting your your artistic attempts yeah how do you deal with those lucas you should talk about you should open this one up um, well, I think both um, uh, Carmel and Martina and and we um, in Australia we spoke about the idea of invitations, and I think Michael, you're you know working on that basis as well. Like it's projects like this or relationships like this begin with invitations, which is kind of interesting, and they're not. Um, in our case, anyway, it's not an invitation from a art gallery or cultural institution. It's an invitation from people who are working in the uh, community or industry of farming that start a project happening. And that's pretty important. And um, I think just to shout out to, you know, a key um, art and ecology artist group, the Harrison Studio, who've inspired a lot of the ways that we work or we've bounced off their ideas or their methods. They also talk about um, beginning with an invitation um, rather than kind of uh, parachuting into a place, you know, and kind of muscling their way in and showing everybody what's what. So that's pretty important. And we talked about John Sweet as the 80-something-year-old retired farmer who was a cultural activator, I guess we would call him. Um, and... Um, I would say that he used us um, as a kind of tool to gain access to people within his own local community that he otherwise wouldn't have access to. He would say, oh, these artists are coming. 
to visit. They're only going to be here for a short amount of time and then he would gain access to a meeting with the local mayor or the local uh, political um, state leader, something like that. And we would sit as well and learn about agricultural policies or these kinds of things. And, and he would then um, use us, you know, as frame us as visiting dignitaries somehow as a way of achieving his own agenda. So, um, you know, and um, from our point of view, you know, we, um, I'm using the word using in a very um, positive way here, you know, everyone has an agenda and everybody's using everybody else to achieve their agenda within their own communities. And um, as long as we uh, acknowledge what's going on and consent to it, it can be quite interesting to, to do that kind of cultural exchange. Um, and resistance has come up because, um, well, that's why we're doing these projects at all, right? If everything was everything was beautiful and happy and uh, harmonious, there would be no need for us to be involved. But they also create the tensions that make for an interesting project. And in, in our case, like a classic um, resistance that we had was from um, a group um, which ran the local Friends of the Botanic Gardens Society. And they'd put in 25 years of work establishing the Botanic Gardens, which we, our project was situated in. And they did not at all like the idea of uh, planting of agricultural crops at the Botanic Gardens. They said that wasn't appropriate. It should be um, native plants rather than agricultural plants. And um, as much as we to enter into a dialogue with them about how um, the kind of agriculture that our collaborators were working on was a way forward towards the uh, increased biodiversity in the region, um, that explanation fell on deaf ears. So that was a, uh, a kind of tension that we had within the community with people who we would imagine otherwise should be allies of what we're doing. Um, there was a kind of territorial resistance perhaps to um, introduced species or agricultural species versus native species of plants. They're just a couple of examples from our projects. I'm sure the others have uh, your own versions of things like that. How about Xi Tan? Xi Tan, did anybody you try to interview for your project like um, not interested, or like how do you find these people to interview? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Uh, you just ask us uh, some friend or some to in introduce me to you know people like the. Michael is <laughs> somebody in, introduced me to know know him, and I, I also interviewed uh, him, so I like his work very much. So, but especially in now, I just talk in China. Uh, now it's really difficult. You want to interview farmer or something, you know, the, everything is controlled. Yeah, and uh, yeah, if you you go to a village, you want a village, you say I want to interview somebody. People were training something. Some people, and uh, everybody. You, you, if you, uh, not just me. You say I want to talk to somebody. The same people will come. You know, same. You go there. I go there. We were, you know, it's controlled. So it's very important. You, you just find your way. <laughs> your way. I were always so, you know, in in China, the many scholars, they uh, they just work work worked by with the government. I think we as artists, we should keep a distance. Uh, we we can find so if you, yeah, keep far away. <laughs> no, don't do the same thing. <laughs> Yeah, but in the, how to say, if you go to um, 
uh, outside of China, you just uh, need the institute or friend to introduce some friend to you to in to interview. Yeah. Yeah. So do you? Uh, yeah, Michael, go ahead. Oh, oh, it's okay. Oh, Jennifer, you could go because uh, were you responding to Chotan? Uh, yeah, no, I was just going to ask then, so when you do your projects, do you, um, in, so according to Shita, I think it's kind of like stay away from the government, right? And then some of your projects are obviously not aligned with what's happening in, in uh, not aligned with the state, but some are probably more, maybe more along the lines of, may be useful to the community or to the city. So how, how do you kind of uh, look at these different political or bigger kind of environment? That was my question, but Mike, yeah, you can ask yours, maybe. Should I talk? Mike will talk. Oh, um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, uh, there were as yeah, I mentioned leg legislative councillors. Well, I guess you could, you could interpret them as members of parliament um, who were supportive and joined the villagers struggle. Um, yeah, they became very uh, vocal and um, very vulnerable. Um, one of them is actually in, in prison right now, um, yet to be charged. Um, for other seemingly other other reasons, and um, yeah, I think organizing is yeah is very difficult when there's this type of control and, and power dynamics. Um, relate in relation to power dynamics, um, the comment that I wanted to talk about earlier was uh, relating to to different types of villages. Um, so the ones that I, I shared in in my presentation, those are the villages that I became most most friendly with. Um, those who have lived in the village for decades, maybe 60, 50, 60 years. Um, but it's also important to acknowledge um, villagers who are tenants uh, in the village who are renting um, low cost uh housing um working class people um who are um probably th the most marginalized in terms of um compensation and housing rights uh compensation yeah being very low for all types of villages but for them um like next to nothing and i i would say yeah, perhaps back to back to Kim's question. Um, the challenges are really time, because the eviction is time related, like due to yeah the government's oppression. Um, so the, those those villager stories are, are very yeah difficult to, or the, some villagers are even difficult to engage with because they're working long hours, maybe six days a week. Um, and yeah, I'm reminded that there was so much to, to learn, to learn from and with, um, a villager who was very skilled in creating electric bicycles and hacking existing bicycles to be, yeah, motor powered, um, for his recycling work. Um, I remember us speaking about potentially doing a workshop. Um, teaching people how to customize their bicycles to become motorized, uh, electric, uh, powered. Um, but sadly, yeah, there was just a lack of time. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, maybe we could go back to Jennifer's question about uh, <laughs> state, state, stake, uh, <laughs> stakeholders. <laughs> Um, o sea, I think the state is a 
o sea, en world, eh, Worldwide, o sea, one of the videos that Lucas and Kim showed, ¿no? When the farmer said, like, there is only 1% of the population who works in agriculture when before you, o sea, your family used to work or you knew somebody that used to work, ¿no? And this has changed because of the violence of the state, ¿no? That the state is completely against the little producer and it's... Um, supporting the big industry that is polluting the world, that is taking the resources that it's... And o sea, now in, in the school that we're making in, in, La, in Milpalta, one of, actually one of the farmers is a lawyer and he explained it like perfectly, like the laws is here to uh, empower the big industry and to exterminate all the little uh, farms. And I still don't understand what this is, o sea, why, o sea, why is these politicians doing that? Because o sea, the little farmers are using less resources and are feeding much more people. And o sea, the efficiency of the way they are growing food is much more wider. No? So now I think we have seen that all this green revolution is completely, it's not true, it's nonsense. O sea, they're taking away all the resources, the water, the soil, everything for this thing about feeding humanity, but humanity is not being fed, no? So humanity is being completely desnutrido, I don't know. So we are getting food that is has non uh, nutritional value. And this thing is about, so it, and it's not about the food, it's about who is owning the land at the end, no? And how the politics needs to be of distributing the land and to give back autonomous of, of people to be able to grow their food, to be to support their life, no? And for us, o sea, in Mexico, that we have a very strong, um, I don't know, history of, of revolution and of people like taking, uh, like going in, in big uh, demonstrations to be against the government and the laws. But we have been doing like residencies project in, in, in the UN, or, United, ¿cómo se llama? La Europa, Europe, Europe, and <laughs> that this place, this place <laughs> in the north, <laughs> and it's, o sea, when they talk me about their laws, when we work with farmers, it's like completely insane, o sea, not being able to take, o sea, use your own seeds to, to sell food, o sea, not being able to, o sea, all to kill time. your own animals or to transform the milk into cheese. Sí, o sea, like this industrialization, this over hygienic, o sea, I don't know, this killing of microorganisms, o sea, it's really, for me, that's the most scary, no, the, the, see, the violence that farmers are living because of, of the state, for, and for me, that's the most scary part, so. Yeah. Very good question. <laughs> uh, Shitan, you wanted to say something just now. Uh, did uh, you, you, to, uh, did, did you, you want to What's your something? question? <laughs> oh, um, no, I was actually asking about uh, how whether people choose to work with the government or how maybe some of the projects can so uh, opposite uh, yeah. from what the government wants so and you said that you want to stay away yeah yeah uh two years ago some scholars from beijing uh, uh central government uh, the central institute of the research Social Science Research Institute, the scholars from there, they they ask us a question. You asked us to, to do the, you want to do the social investigation. So where do you get money? <laughs> Because, you know, they get a lot of money, million um, and a million to do some research. Uh, I say we have no money, we are poor. <laughs> The sec second question is, uh, how what, what, how is the relationship between you and the local government? We say, we're just, uh, how do you say, <laughs> keep away. 
So this is, you cannot know the, the truth. I say you can also not as well. <laughs> because the, the research, social research in, in China, you have to go the way through the government, you know. They will give you some, how to say, some information. They send somebody to talk to you. Yeah. We just go away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we'll go edge. Yeah. This is a, yeah, maybe we cannot find the truth, but it, who can do that? Actually, the, yeah. You, and I, I think you should understand what, what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and also friends is so important. Like like the Annie, just the, you introduced to me. <laughs> yeah, but she is so important to me. <laughs> I think um, that's for me. I feel so happy to know her and to talk to her. Yeah, I, I, if you say that's not the truth, oh, but uh, yeah, I think I like that. <laughs> I like I like what he, she said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you all very tired? Should we go on? <laughs> okay, I'll ask another question then. Um, okay, various people. Okay, so Michael, I uh, know. Okay, so Lucas started uh, talking about in uh, what land you're on, right? Like indigenous lands. Um, and um, and also, uh, I think for collect collectivo Amaso, Amasio, uh, you also kind of work with traditional or like old knowledge about how to how to grow the plants and things like that so i'm wondering and then shitan also mentioned about um you know this uh japanese botanist who also be, you know brings in the scientific knowledge so how do you see all these different kind of belief systems and and different forms of knowledge coming together in your work with the farmers do you try to integrate that or, you know, what, what do you do with all that? Because it's all kind of different and a lot. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I can start. O sea, I think it's, we have to start from the the part that we don't speak the same language. O sea, in, even though we speak both uh, Spanish, we don't speak the same language at all, no? So I think that was one of the also good things about using collecting, co collective cooking as a methodology of listening to others. Because when you start to cook with other women, you start to create a new language or translating both language, no, because you need so much time together. So because it's not only this knowledge of this herb is for this, this herb is for that. So it's it's another cosmovision, it's another world of understanding. So it's completely opposite of what of I of what I was being taught or where I was or where I grew up grow up. So for me, this the only way to to start to un, unwrap and to start to understand both point of views is yes to do things together, and putting the body to dance, no. And I think is this is also the origin of language, no. So it was when we did stuff together, like in community, and like we start dancing together, language start to appear, no. So it's again dancing with this woman, and start to do. See, to, to recreate a language so we can start to understand other ways of knowing, other ways of related to the plants, to the milpa, to the corn, to because see, because the way I think I was taught in this urban area is is collapsing in a way. O sea, it's collapsing. O sea, we are, o sea, yesterday I was with an agro for a, a guy who plants food like in industrial ways and he was like no I, the only thing I, I need to think about is how i can diminish cost 
no, this is not the language I want to speak. I want to speak a new language where the corn is not about how what is the price of the corn in the market. No, I want to talk about the life of the corn and how if he's, he's feeling sad or if he's missing the hands of the people who's taking care of it. And that's the language. These people of, of Milpalta talk, so they talk as a living being, they talk as somebody who is who can think, who can give you things in return. O sea, in, actually, the name uh, Malatepec Momoshko, the name, the, the original name, means altar. So the way the place where they grow the, the food is, is an altar. And they were giving back their, their energy, their work, and they were giving things in return. And it's not something, it's something so material that you're taking care and the land is taking care of you back now. So it's this relation that I'm tr we are trying to figure it out how to reconnect with that because I think it's also the origin of 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 humanity in a way, no? Okay. That's really really beautiful the way that you talk about the materiality of the corn and and how that connects with deep cultural connections with people. Uh, rather than the standard way in capitalism of thinking about agricultural products as a means to an end. It's a kind of an object that has nutrient in it, um, which you purchase and then discard. And it, it connects, I think, to the story, beautiful story from Michael about the jackfruit fruit ritual of communally disassembling the jackfruit and how the materiality of the jackfruit requires this coming together and you know this sitting in a circle and that has this kind of other outcome it's not it's not just a means to an end it builds the social relations around around that um that living being that nurtures us so i think these are different and different um you know geographical landscapes or different places or what are called in australia countries lend themselves to different kinds of materials that emerge whether it's corn or jackfruit or in this case an industrial crop sugarcane which has thrived under terrible um, social relations slavery and chemical exploitation and and tillage and you know mechanization with tractors and all those kinds of things that are quite far away from the the beauty of the social relations that you are talking about from your Hong Kong and Mexico examples. And um, yeah, so we, I guess what we learned from our project in that regard was the value of slowing down an industrial cropping process and reintroducing human labor. Because the, when you mechanize a crop like sugarcane, then you might have one farmer on 300 hectares of land as opposed to I don't know if you were doing it by hand you would have hundreds of people working together and that that has all of these flow on side effects of developing cultural formations that um otherwise you know the depopulized popular the depopulation of rural areas is a problem all around the world in the in the case of um our our work with the sugarcane um community you know I guess it's really different to your experience, Michael, and yours, um, Carmen and Martina, in that sugarcane is a crop of colonisation. You know, that's that's the sort of starting point and, and the devastation that that has caused not only on the environment but also on traditional owners and on, as Lucas said, on the South Sea Island communities who were forced into slavery on those sugarcane plantations in the early days. So there is a lot of um, dispossession and conflict in at the sort of source of that industry. But at the same time, um, there's also that kind of pride in work that comes out in, in those kind of cultural events that we, that we organised and staged in that nevertheless, despite those kind of dark histories, 
there's that sort of physical labour and and the pride in in objects and in 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 plants and things that that come out when you sort of reenact those those sorts of um, practices of phys- of physical labour. I don't know if I'm making any sense there, but um, you know the sort of pride in ritual, the pride in work, the pride in teamwork. The yeah is is still there in the kind of historical stories of sugarcane farming um, prior to mechanisation. Yes, maybe because the the sugarcane was like an, an imposed uh, yes crop, you know, on, exactly. Like, no, and, and it create different relationships. Exactly. Than, exactly. than, than whatever you are growing. No? So that's, yes. So, Uh, can I t- uh, talk a story? Uh, when I was in the Kyoto, uh, I interviewed another three professors from the Kyoto University. Uh, all of them are botanists. They are from the botanical department. They taught. They, they told me a story. Is the in the campo, um, they want to build a new building uh, for the teaching for the education. For the teaching, but there are very old, very big trees just along the the place. They want to, they have to <laughs> cut it, and <laughs> and after then, the professor say all the teachers of the department of the botanical department they come together to face the trees, and using the very Japanese. Uh, religion's way very <laughs> said to the trees uh, dear dear uh, we need a place but we I, we will not hurt you uh, we just want to move you uh, uh, you don't you should not be scared we just keep you alive we will protect you very much they're using the Japanese way, they were knee or something, I don't know. They were knee, face to the tree. And uh, all the teachers, and then they moved the tree to another place. I, I really touched. I said, think it, that's life. Ah, the trees, that's life. So I think this is, I, I say, why say this is an Eastern Asian's way mixed with the science. There are scientists. In the same time, they believe every tree with the soul. I sometimes ask, you are really believe that? They say, yes. <laughs> I, I think uh, that's very interesting. So I think um, um, this is, uh, I think, very important thing is how can the Asian people, they can keep two value, uh, modern science and also your local belief, I think. Maybe that's the that's, uh, um, yeah, that's positive. Not, not, not like we say. Oh, you are the. Uh, uh, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, my story. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I I don't think uh, I don't think we are getting any questions from the viewers. Um, actually, Lucas has kind of answered some. Uh, do you want to elaborate on anything, or you you are okay with that for now? Um, I just uh, in case I don't know um, if people on the different platforms are seeing the questions, but I think they maybe they are. Okay, um, so um, basically the question was about the um, sunflowers. <laughs> uh, does yeah. Simon make more money from sugar over sunflower? Yeah. Uh, do they have less negative effect? And why yeah. sunflowers? Yeah. So the question about whether sunflowers or sugarcane have more positive or negative environmental effects, the it's really just about monoculture. This is just things that we learned from the farmers that we worked with. 
the monoculture system is the damaging thing rather than the specific species and the you know system of globalization in agriculture is what leads to the local agricultural system um, tending towards monoculture because it's a lot easier to manage and harvest and process and export those crops and once you start introducing multiple different species into an agricultural system you need multiple different kinds of equipment different kinds of attachments on your tractors to harvest them and plant them and things like that and then different kinds of um, uh, places like mills or processing facilities to process the different crops that you generate so it becomes more and more complex um, from the point of view of industrial agriculture the more species you introduce so this is these are the things that mitigate against multi-species cropping which is good for soil and so the sunflowers were introduced as a way of breaking the monoculture um, rather than necessarily being a, a financial in, um, outcome in their own right however simon did develop a system for harvesting the sunflowers because they grow faster than the sugar cane so he would end up with two uh, harvest crops from the same piece of land and he could sell the sunflowers as a it was like a minor component of his overall income but the major component of the major contribution that sunflowers made was to the soil biology uh, under underground a kind of invisible contribution I think this one question is quite important, which is, uh, I think we can open this up to everyone. So actually, how do you uh, look at the diversity of ecosystem as a whole and uh, work towards a long run, long term progress? So how does your work contribute to the ecosystem as a whole, probably? Um, do you think of it? at all or it's just you're just kind of interested in just specific areas in our case um regenerative agriculture can be a applied across all domains of farming so it's not specific to sugarcane the sugarcane industry it can be applied right across Australia or any part of the world, really. So in that sense, yes, it is very, very concerned with the whole ecosystem, notwithstanding the fact that we are humans, uh, we have many humans on the planet <laughs> who need to eat. And so, um, you know, in one way or another, we're going to kind of disturb the natural order of things. But the, I think the best thing that we can do is to always think of of what we do as replenishing and regenerating rather than taking from so so yes i do think we we do think of our our work as a microcosm of what can happen very broadly across the country see i want to add something very quick uh, to this question um, something that happened in the market uh, we did in the uh, in the contemporary art museum in Mexico City. So when the market was happening, uh, there was a very devastating uh, natural disaster happening in the coast of the Pacific in Mexico that destroyed the crops of many communities. And thanks to the uh, biodiversity that and the health of the ecosystem in Milpalda to the biodiversity to the uh, to the seeds that they had <coughs> they could give back to that community uh, their surplus uh, uh, of, of corn to the other communities so I guess also taking care of your ecosystem is saying like when you have to take care also of your ecosystem so whenever we have a problem like a drought and you have a good you can give me back so I think it's very important to see also taking care of your ecosystem as a way of, of ensuring other people, other communities, and then other communities taking care of their ecosystem. I don't know if I can <laughs> explain it good, but 
is how can everybody uh, be responsibility of our own place so if any other place have a problem we can help them and then we'll, they will help us if we have a problem no so it's also not only taking care of our communities but start to make a uh, like like networks with other communities so we can be like this see when this a like a whole and when these climate effects come because they will came and they will be very strong we could be a network that takes the the, the bits but if we are a network we can take it less harm in a less harmful way thank you very good <laughs> Yeah, um, good question, <laughs> Jennifer. Um, I guess those ecocidal projects that developers and the government propose in Hong Kong uh, are very destructive to different ecologies. Um, if you remember the photograph I showed of the direct action where many activists climbed onto the excavator to prevent the destruction of that farmland, uh, later that farmland was uh, yeah, completely fenced off and just left to grow grow wildly until the government granted the developer um, permission to start building on it. And during those times when um, it was uncultivated, um, the drainage of that farm um, that farmers created through decades, uh, yeah, became... Um, yeah, overgrown, and that led to a lot of flooding in that area. Um, and also, <laughs> well, a lot of snakes uh, decided to, to make their homes there as well. Um, so yeah, th these kind of disturbances um, on cultivated land, um, the hoarding, the boarding up of agricultural land also, yeah, affect uh, the terrain and um, yeah, make life in, inhabitable, uninhabitable. Um, yeah, for humans and, and, and different species as well. Um, although I think probably with the flooding, the bullfrogs uh, really had a, a, a good time. Um, I remember they were very vocal um, at night time. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I guess. Yeah, different ecologies emerge as well through through destruction, and yeah, I hope yeah this could also continue on in terms of community building as well. Um, that we're not always reactionary to to those ecocidal projects, but um, also yeah, proactive and and kind of living living a life, practicing a life that we. Uh, yeah, we want to build collectively. Okay, uh, shall we just end with the last question then? Yeah, because it's quite late. Uh, okay, so Margaret Roberts uh, wants to ask, what do you think about the relationship between art and activism that is so fundamental to all your practices? So maybe we can go one round and then we just close the session. Okay. Yeah, who wants to go first? Okay, maybe first do you think you do you do you consider what you're doing activism? And then then what is the relationship between art and activism and what you're doing? I'll go. I don't really know what I'm going to say other than um, <laughs> um, I guess we do what we're doing because we do want to be part of um, some kind of, you know, like a, a, a positive world and that does involve doing things outside of the gallery. Um, and it, sometimes it looks like activism and sometimes it doesn't. Um, I think about 
Lucas and I had to meet with a the local politician up in that place where we were working, and he's a very, very well known, very cons- very conservative politician. Um, if we had gone to him with uh, with a kind of conventional form of activist protest, then he wouldn't have let us in our in his door. But we actually had quite a, an interesting meeting with him because we went calling ourselves sort of artists rather than activists, even though our sympathies would totally align with the local activist community where we were working. So I guess, yes, I do consider myself an activist, but but maybe um, in sometimes in ways that don't necessarily look like activism. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> Um, I can share my thoughts on it. Um, for me, putting art and activism together is fundamental. So first of all, because I think that more than ever, we need a lot of creativity uh, in the way we are doing activism. And also to change the idea that being resistant it's a weight on us, no? Like this thing that you have to suffer in order to to fight against the, I don't know, whatever you want to fight with. But this thing about you can do it creatively, you can do it by celebrating, you can do it with other people, you can do it in so many ways. And I think if you do it in a, in a place that you are happy doing it and that you are not suffering and that at, at the contrary, that you are enjoying it, you can do it for longer and longer and longer. And, and that, it becomes a way of living. And it becomes a way of living that you are not then not depending on, on the power that you are uh, against it. You know? So for me, it's something that needs to be together in order to, to sustain a practice of, of resistance. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, maybe just to follow up on that, um, yeah, it reminds me of uh, Bell Hooks saying that there should be joy in the struggle um, in Hong Kong, I think, um, like convivial resistance, <laughs> like joyful uh, resistance. And um, I think in some of the projects today, such as event organizing, coming together and building something collectively is is part of that practice. And also, oh, I was gonna say, um, yeah, building a culture of resistance. This is, uh, yeah, some friends uh, in the west of France uh, remind me um, that, yeah, the boundaries between art and activism are very blurry. They complement each other um, as well as empower each other. Um, so, yeah, just to to keep going, uh, <laughs> whatever feels most comfortable, whatever um, creative form or medium is most uh, suitable for the context. Um, yeah, and to keep trying as well and borrowing from each other, uh, especially, yeah, land struggles. There's a rich history. Um, yeah, from many different countries, and um, to to learn from each other's um, learn each learn each, yeah, learn from each other's methods, and to to see how they could be tweaked for um, yeah local contexts. Thanks, Margaret. I have another story about the social, uh, um, how to say, activists. Uh, in 1990, uh, 2090s, uh, 90, um, so in Guangzhou, there are a street, a community, some uh, residents, they, uh, they built 
how to say they plan uh, a garden on street, but the government, local government, know that and they come to destroy it. They say you cannot do that without our performance. <laughs> so, uh, how to say we, we do not agree with you do that. You cannot do that because uh, if you do that, a lot of the mosquito will come. So the residents they feel so unhappy. So I I came there. I say, come come to them. Uh, we can do something. I say, uh, we can do something. How do you say? We go to the a museum just the, on the um, community. We the first we invite. Uh, how do you say? Interview all these plant. How the planters, the residents. Uh, let them talk about their feeling, uh, and then we do the research about the the species of the the flower in the how to say in the garden. Yeah, which was destroyed, and then we make the same thing in inside the museum, <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, but we have no. Uh, the the plants we just make uh, ask the kids their kids to make some with some material to make the how to say like a sculpture or something we 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 call it soft revolt soft revolt you should you cannot revolt revolt the, because they are they have the power they do so if you don't do that people will forget it. Something never happened, so we say we, we should remember it. Make the video or, or make a research. I know we make a show, very big show inside. <laughs> we say uh, the soft revolt. Um, yeah, I think um, this is the way in China. Yeah, yeah. So because they say, oh, we we plant some flower. They will, how to say, uh, bring the problem of the mosquito. But if you, if you, this is the reason you should cut all the trees in the city. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, they feel. I think they feel um, the show or the. Yeah, I think for me, I think it's really touch. I think yeah, we can do something to, to memory that. Yeah. This thing, yeah. Okay, Lucas, you want to respond to this question? Otherwise, we're close. No, I think everybody's covered it. I think the yeah, there's there's so many um, responses there around art and activism that I, I don't need to add any extra. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Then thanks for sharing your your learnings and for t for coming and spending like three hours with us. Um, and uh, there are people still watching at the at objectives on the actual site with the bamboo. So, so thank you to you guys too for coming. And um, I guess we'll take this offline then. Uh, so the video is available on YouTube and Facebook. I think after this, so uh, feel free to go back and watch it. And then I'll be in touch with you, uh, speakers as well. Thank you. And have a nice night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Jennifer. Good night. Good night. Bye.